Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mount Olive Baptist Church. I can honestly say I'm glad to see a lot of you. See? See? Y'all are paying attention. I like that. I like that. But we're, no, we're glad, to hear, we're glad to see you here this morning and glad for bringing a little bit of laughter to you as well. Um, if you can look on the back of your bulletin, we've got several announcements. It is the busy time of the year and it'll just keep getting busier as we get closer towards Christmas. There is a ladies' Bible study on October 11th. A pastor Appreciation Covered Dish Luncheon will be on October 17th. Um, there will be a brown bag lunch and Bible study on October 22nd at 12 o'clock. Also, we will have an associational prayer meeting here at Mount Olive Baptist Church at 6 o'clock. That will be on Sunday night. So there will be people from kind of throughout the association that will come here. So, you know, we want to make a good showing. So if you feel led or would like to just do some prayer, we welcome you to come. And we'll just have an opportunity for us to sort of break out in small groups and have some scripture reading and just pray about God's direction for our association and God's direction for our country and just anything we can think of that we might want to pray on while we're gathered together. Also, the association meeting is the very next day. We will be having trunk or treat at 6.30 on October 30th and the party in the fellowship hall at 7.30. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of y'all wear costumes and uh, if you come wearing what you're wearing now, then I'll just call it a costume when I see you on Sunday. So that's on you, not me. Uh, please see Philip Thomas if you're willing to do a trunk for trunk or treat. Um, the youth are meeting upstairs in room 10 with me on Sunday mornings for Sunday school and on Wednesday nights in the youth room with Joe Godfrey. October is the month of prayer for the Sandy Creek Baptist Association. So we do have a, an insert on the back of the prayer sheet that shows you kind of the prayer emphasis. So we're just asking folks to be in prayer for the association this month especially. Um, also, there's an opportunity here to join together with some other believers if you need information on religious exemption letters or dealing with religious issues at work in that kind of context. So there's contact email here and a phone number if you need more information. Also, during the month of October, we are collecting for the Baptist Children's Home of North Carolina. So we have additional envelopes in the back and in, in the bulletins. There are also an insert that has information on them as well if you'd like to see what the money goes to. Also, we have a few VBS volunteer shirts, so please see Suzanne Jones if you'd like one. And if you have any questions about that, you can see her or myself as well. Please turn to the prayer list for me. We need to be in prayer for Ms. Shirley Christopher, the procedure that she had, the family of Gladys Church, the family of Ronald Davis, Mike Jackson. Just give you all a quick update on Mike. He did have surgery earlier this week, and uh, I spoke to him yesterday on the phone and got to visit with him one time this week, and also just talking with Ashley this morning. He should be released tomorrow, uh, so they're, they're putting him on a liquid diet, and if he's able to take foods, he should be able to come home tomorrow, so we're... We're thankful for that. Uh, he had some ulcers, for those of you wondering what was wrong. It didn't have anything to do with his COVID. He had some ulcers. So we're praising God for that. Uh, family of Randy King, family of Karen Oldham, and the family of Joe Bill Lindley. Also, Glenn Williams will be having back surgery this week, so let's please be in prayer for him. Where'd you go? Where'd you go, Glenn? I know you're in here. There you are. Sometimes you just blend in by sitting in the same spot every week, I guess. So there's Glenn right there. Make sure to tell him that you're going to pray for him this week with his back. And uh, we have an announcement from Joe. Joe? I want to give one real quick announcement. Um, this, this year, we're going to do something a little different. Um, in the past, we've done... Sometimes it's been individual for the Operation Christmas Child. Uh, sometimes it's been church-sponsored, or we've done it and collected church. What we're going to do this year, we, we're still going to allow the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes to be brought individually to the church, and we'll make sure they get to a distribution site. But this year, corporately as a church, what we would like to do is do a, the Appalachian Christmas Outreach. Um, essentially, this is a packing backpacks and it's almost like the same thing you do for operation christmas child but these backpacks will actually be taken to a local appalachian state and i say that 
There are multiple states, multiple sites that get these backpacks. North Carolina, there's actually a couple sites here in North Carolina, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And what will happen is we're actually working to collect the backpacks soon, and the packing date will be on Wednesday night, November 3rd. We would like to pack those backpacks. And we will be, there'll be more information coming forward, but essentially some of the items that are needed for these backpacks will be warm clothing, such as winter hats, pair of gloves, socks, maybe a scarf, pop-up can, pop-top canned food, we'll put some in there. Um, we'll be make sure that we put some toys or some instruments in there for people. It starts at age four, goes up to age 17, so naturally an age, uh, a 17 year old young man or young lady might not want a toy, but something like a flashlight or something, earbuds, something like that might be um, appropriate for that age group. Also, hygiene items, um, a Bible, and we'll be looking to get those Bibles. The good thing is there are some bulk websites that we can order some of the things from, uh, such as the backpacks, the Bibles, and some of the other items. We'll be, uh, be working with Suzanne to get those on order. But I want you to be praying about this. Um, I'm not setting a goal. I'm thinking maybe 30 backpacks. The goal statewide is 18,000 backpacks. That sounds like a lot, okay? And it is a lot. But if you look at, and I'm hoping we'll have a video ready for next Sunday that you can see. If you, if you look at some of the sites, and some of you have been to some of these sites, I think we've had a couple mission trips. Um, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, there are some areas that um, it, it's really tough to see sometimes. Kids don't have a whole lot. And this is kind of like the Operation Christ Christmas Child where they will actually be given an opportunity to open a, a gift that they probably wouldn't receive otherwise from a family member or whatever. So the goal here is for us as a church to pack up to 30 backpacks. That's just a guess um, right now. We'll see how it goes, but we would like to pack those on November 3rd. There'll be more information in the bulletin in the next couple of weeks. And I'll try to have a video ready for next Sunday. But I want you to be praying about this. It's, it's, it's a very needy cause. When you look at the videos and, and some of the testimony from the children and some of the churches in the area, it's a, some amazing testimony. So I just want you to be praying about it. We are going to uh, set this as a goal this year. I've talked to Pastor Josh and Suzanne and Josh Connor before he left, and we're all in agreement this is something we want to do as a church. That's not going to take away from your individual packed Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. We will still make sure they get to where they need to go if you want to pack some. But this is something we want to do as a church this year. If you have any questions, please ask me, and I'll have some answers for you. And there'll be more information next couple of weeks, okay? And don't forget the meal next Sunday for, for uh, Pastor Josh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for cool mornings like today. We thank you for the month of October where after all summer, we finally get some days where it doesn't feel so difficult to walk outside. We thank you for the good days and the bad, but we thank you especially, Lord, that we get to gather into your house this morning for worship. We ask, Father, that you would speak to our hearts and minds through the singing, through the sermon, through the response time. God, each and every aspect of this service, may it be dedicated to you, set apart from you, and glorified in you. May, may we be your vessels here on the earth, God. May we be your instruments of peace to those in our community. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If you'd all turn your hymnals or look on the screen, we're going to sing hymn number 411, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." Jesus. 
Good morning. If you turn turn with me now to um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Um, it's on page 1015 in the Pew Bible, but it's also, of course, up on the screen. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It's 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may, be the weak, she may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together in this place to hear your word uh, spoken and preached and to praise you and glorify you. Lord, we pray that you would open our ears to hear your voice and soften our heart that we may understand your words. And Lord, just help us um, to be an example that our relationships within the marriage would reflect your relationship with your church, your love for your people. And Lord, just give us that understanding and the strength to follow it through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's more that dances on the prairies than the wind More that pulses on the ocean than the tide There's a love that's fiercer than a love between friends More gentle than a mother's when her baby's at her side And there's a loyalty that's deeper than mere sentiment Music higher than the songs that I can sing The stuff of earth competes for the allegiance I owe only to the giver of all good things So if I stand, let me stand on the promise That you will pull me through And if I can, let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you And if I sing, let me sing for the joy That is born in me these songs But if I weep, let it be as a man Who is longing for his home There's more that rises in the mornings than the sun And more that shines in the night than just the moon There's more than just this fire here that keeps me warm And a shelter that is larger than this room And there's a loyalty that's deeper than mere sentiment And a music higher than the songs that I can sing 
The stuff of earth competes for the allegiance I owe only to the giver of all good things So if I stand, let me stand on the promise That you would pull me through And if I can't let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you And if I sing, let me sing for the joy that you have borne in me these songs But if I weep, let it be as a man who is longing for his home And if I stand, let me stand on the promise that you will pull me through. And if I can't, let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you. And if I sing, let me sing for the joy that you have borne in me these songs. And if I weep, let it be as a man who is longing for his home. But if I weep, let it be as a man who is longing for his home. Well, today we look at the easy topic of marriage, so uh, go ahead and open your Bibles. <laughs> go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians, y'all. When I was picking these uh, chapters to go through in Ephesians, I didn't remember that this was there. So, you know, God, God surprises all of us and His timing is perfect. So Ephesians chapter 5, we'll be looking at verses 21 through 32 of Ephesians chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and his self is its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. During the time I was stationed in Europe, I had opportunity to visit Florence, Italy. And during my time in Italy, I visited the cathedral in Florence. It's famous because it takes over 400 steps to get to the top of the cathedral. And at around step 200, there's a little break in the action. There's a little cut in the side of the cathedral. And you can look out and you have this little bird's eye view about halfway up. And, and it's beautiful. You can sort of see a little bit of wooded area in the distance. You see a little bit of what the rest of the city looks like. 
Then you climb the 200 plus more stairs and you get to the very tip top. And as I came up, I was sweaty, I was tired, and I was a little bit claustrophobic. <laughs> so I came up and I looked and it was completely worth it because when I got to the top, I saw in the distance gorgeous farmland, the Tuscan hillside. I saw other beautiful buildings in Florence that I wanted to go visit. I saw Michelangelo's workshop. I saw the traffic. I saw the road conditions and the weather. And when I was at the bottom, I saw things at the top that I could never even dream were in the city. And you see, marriage and God's perspective on marriage is much the same way. We have our own opinion and our own views about what marriage might mean, but God in His Word has directed us to His perspective. So our question today is, what is God's perspective on marriage and how can we implement it in our daily lives? Well, the first thing God says is in verses 21 through 24. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now submission is not the idea that one person is better than another. It's simply that one person bears more responsibility and holds the ultimate spiritual authority. Submission should never be immoral, unethical, or illegal. It's about men valuing, caring for, and dying to themselves in making decisions for their family. Submission is not subjugation. Listen, subjugation turns a person into a thing, destroys individuality, and removes all liberty. Submission makes a person more aware of what God wants them to be. It brings out their individuality. It gives them freedom to accomplish all that God has for their lives. Warren Wiersbe. On my last military deployment, I put on my sergeant stripes. And I was so excited because that meant there were that many less people that I had to listen to. Or so I thought. <laughs> you see, when you work in the military, especially in the Air Force, you have to listen to other sergeants of your same rank. Because they might have seniority, especially dealing with a project. And so sergeants have to listen to senior sergeants. And they have to listen to senior NCOs, and those senior NCOs have to listen to officers, and those officers have to listen to even higher officers, and those officers have to answer to the commander of your unit, who might be hundreds of miles away and in a different country, which was our case when we were in Afghanistan. You see, submission in marriage is a little bit like submission in the military, because submission to your leaders when you're an officer and when you're an enlisted man is dependent upon how good your leadership really is. If they have a good positive attitude and they're not lording it over their people, it can be a pretty fun experience. But if they're ignorant or arrogant, they can make the whole experience negative. They can make it more difficult to follow and even sometimes have to go outside your train of command to take care of issues. And marriage and submission works the same way. It can be difficult if you're not with a trustworthy person. The biggest example in my marriage is that my wife submitted to me by moving to Pittsburgh, North Carolina. I got an email one day and I prayed. And I met with Jane and Dan and Suzanne and some of my other friends. And over time, I began to feel like God was leading me to come here. But can, can you imagine that? Just because you're married to some guy who thinks God is telling you to move halfway across the country right after your kidneys fail and you give birth to a little baby, it's time for you to move to the other side of the country. That's submission in our marriage, y'all. And sometimes I think the pastor's wife doesn't get as much credit for that. And I'm preaching today, so I'm giving her credit. <laughs> but listen, submission in marriage also has to be mutual. For some reason, the Bible cuts off in a lot of our translations, 21 from 22. But y'all, that's a continuous sentence in the Greek now. In fact, the word submit doesn't even exist in verse 22, y'all. It's a continuation of the verse that's mentioned in 21. What he says in the Greek is that they're to be subject to one another. So we're to mutually submit to Christ in marriage out of, out of reverence to God. But then it says, wives, do the same thing you do to the Lord, to your husband. So the idea and the discussion is that submission is a controversial, controversial, often misunderstood issue, isn't it? Let me tell you some things it means and doesn't mean, all right? First, submission is a choice. It is never to be forced on a woman by a man, but is a voluntary act. Second, 
Submission has nothing to do with the intrinsic value of a man or a woman. In other words, we are co-equals. We both bear the image of God in the same way. And we both must submit to God as co-equals. See, neither the man nor the wife is more significant, better, just because they're a man or a woman. Now, there are significant differences between men and women, regardless of what our society tries to tell us today. There are some big physical differences, and there are some psychological differences, and there are some roles in our relationship that are different, and it's silly to pretend that it's not true, because it is. But one is not more important than the other. One is not more intelligent than the other. One is not better than the other. And third, submission is not passivity. In other words, submission is not God saying to women, I need you to change your personality. I need you to change your personality from outgoing to introverted. I need you to stop talking so much. I need you to stop doing so much. I need you to stop being so much. No. She's not to become a doormat or give up who she is. And she's not to completely change her personality. I just got a secret for you guys. There's way more verses in this section about how men are to love and run their house like Christ than there are about women submitting. But why do you think we talk more about one than the other? Because the preachers are male and it's easy to say, you do this. That's why. It's easy. But listen, this is different than a lot of other household codes at the time. You need to understand how revolutionary what he's saying is. Okay, other ancient codes did not emphasize the relationship balance in a marriage. Other ancient codes were about the responsibilities of children and their wives and said nothing about the husbands. The Christian household code emphasizes the husband's responsibilities. This is one of the key differences between Christianity and other religions. Is the husband is the head, even as Christ is the head of the church. And what did he do? He gave himself up for her. So it's almost like he's saying, men, you need to lead your families well. You're to be a head. That means you're responsible, and it's on you. And because you're the head, you need to follow my son's example, who was tortured to death for his family. You see, a lot of guys don't like giving up part of who they are when they get married, right? Uh, They they don't want to stop going out with their friends. They don't want to stop fishing and hunting all hours of the day. They, They don't want to stop playing video games the same amount or watching the movies that they like to watch instead of what the baby wants to watch, Coco Melon. Um... They want their lives to remain unchanged. But this verse means our perspective has to change. So as the church submits to Christ, so also wives must submit in everything to their husbands. Now I want you to think about what I'm saying before you react to it, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, you want to be in charge, men? Then you need to submit yourself to God. Women, you want a good man? You need to submit yourself to God. Then, husbands, talk to me about the submission of your wife. Submission can never be fully separated from God's directive on us as men to be obedient to him. In fact, this is a great test for us as husbands. If your wife isn't submitting in an area of your life, maybe it's raising the children, maybe it's having a two-income or one-income household, maybe it's who does what household chore, you need to ask yourself, am I submitting to Christ in this area or am I trying to force my attitude, my directives, and my thoughts on my wife? Ask yourself with each issue, am I submitting to God or am I trying to force her to submit to me? Remember, we're to mutually submit to Christ. What if the wife is a better leader? Submission has nothing to do with who's a better leader or what the wife brings to the table. It's an acknowledgement that God tells wives to yield to their husbands in spiritual authority. Biblical submission honors the husband's position even if the wife disagrees with his perspective and his decisions. Nevertheless, a wife is never obligated to compromise her commitment to God. Her submission is to be as unto the Lord, the Bible tells us here. Like the Proverbs 31 woman, a wife employs her skills and talents serving her home. She manages the family and helps her husband to make wise decisions. But in the end, a kingdom wife yields to her husband in making final calls after her perspective is heard and valued. For not only does God tell us that we must submit in marriage, but that we must love one another. Look at verses 25 to 27. Husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, 
without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not loved, if I have a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, if I have prophetic powers and all faith as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give everything I have away, if I give up my body to be burned and am martyred for Christ, but don't love, then it's worthless. Listen, love in marriage is hard. Perseverance in marriage is difficult. And in so many ways today, I do not feel worthy to preach this message to you. I'm still trying to live these things out in my own life and figure out what they look like. Men, we need to die to self, die to our own ideas of how life will work out, die to our idealism, die to our version of what our life will look like and fully love our wives. And wives must do the same to the husbands to the best of their ability. Listen, I never dreamed that our first child would destroy my wife's health. I never dreamed that her energy levels would be toast. I never dreamed that my son would be in the NICU for a month. I never dreamed that over a year later that it would still be impacting her. Because that wasn't my idea of what I thought my marriage should look like. I'm so happy that she's not on dialysis anymore, but I mourn some of what was lost will never be returned. And that wasn't my idea of what I wanted my marriage to be. But God said, i got to teach you some things, Josh. God said, there's some imperfection in you I need to shape. And so many of us fight against God's direction in our lives. Listen, I don't believe God causes trauma and tragedy in our lives, but he uses it every single day. So we're to love each other. Husbands, you really need to love your wife like Christ. Because you're the leader, it means you love her. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. But what does that even really mean? We hear that all the time. It means to sacrificially give of yourself for your marriage. If she's going to follow you, then you need to set the standard of care in your relationship. You need to continue to pursue her and die to yourself so effectively that it looks like Jesus' love for the church. No one should ever be talking about how much difficulty is in women submitting to men. What we should be fascinated with is how men are to die like Jesus for their wives. What's got the higher standard, y'all? Growing up in a small town, John traveled to New York City pursuing dreams of excellence. And after a few years there, he met a young woman. And he was excited. They had a great dating relationship. So one day he picked up the phone and he called his mom and dad. And he said, Mom, Dad, I think I'm going to pop the question. You know, and they planned it out, you know, what photographers they were going to have and what videographers they were going to have and how they were going to do it. But then near the end of the phone call, his parents turned to each other and they said, we need to talk to you. He said, okay. And they said, listen, son, you need to know that there's no such thing as a successful marriage. There's just two people unwilling to quit on love. See, we have this idea in our society of what a successful marriage looks like. But really, all you need is two people dedicated to God who aren't willing to give up. That's it. That's it. Now, that's a standard that we can meet, is not giving up. Wow. Christ sanctifies us. He washes us with the word and makes us holy, sacred, set apart, dedicated to God. There is no greater institute in all of humanity that will sanctify us like marriage. Nothing in my life reminds me of how far I need to go than my marriage. Nothing in my life convicts me of my sin like my marriage. But you know what the other side of it is, y'all? There is nothing in my life that is greater pep rally than my marriage. There is nothing and no person on this earth that has supported me and loved me like my wife. Listen, she has encouraged me in ways I didn't even know I needed. <laughs> And over time, we make each other more like Jesus. Just like Christ makes his church look more like him. I mean, have you ever seen one of those old married couples, y'all? That they just start looking alike? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And you're not quite sure which one's the guy and which one's the girl sometimes when you're from afar. And I'm not trying to be mean. But that's what I'm talking about. That's how we should be with Jesus in the church. 
We should start to look so much like Jesus from afar that it's hard to separate whether we're actually Jesus or not. We're cleansed by the washing of the water of the Word so that we might be holy without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. Men, your words mean something to your wives. Are your words life-giving, affirming, and encouraging? Are they, are they tearing down? Because our words have power. And our words are to be cleansing. God compares the way we talk to our wives like the power of his word to our souls. I don't understand why we talk so much about submission, but we don't talk about this. That is heavy. In that passage Dan read for y'all this morning, what did it say at the end? So that your prayers won't be hindered. So, you know what's up? God listens to a man's prayers based on how he treats his wife. Now, if that doesn't scare you a little bit, I don't want to talk to you. It scares me, y'all. And it convicts me. Men, your words have power and they can be giving and positive and encouraging and supporting and helpful. You need to ask yourself, how do you take the lead? Are you humbly serving? And I just need to tell somebody this morning, your strength is not a wrecking ball for your wife's emotional issues. Mm -mm. You're not to destroy, demoralize, demean, or otherwise harm your wife emotionally, physically or otherwise. Men, some of you need to confess your sin. Because you see far too many men in the Christian faith that think headship means I'm a dictator. I get to tell my kids and my wife to jump and they say how high. No. It's not how Jesus did us, is it? Biblical Christian leadership is about being good stewards of our wives. It's about loving like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He literally loved her to his death and allowed him to be tortured. Don't tell me what you had to give up. You didn't die yet. 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, Jesus came down and showed us what love looks like in the form of a cross, and it ought to inform our marriages. A husband is to sacrifice for his wife and to be her deliverer, her protector, and pay the price for her well-being. A kingdom husband is somebody who is his wife's sanctifier. He takes who she is and who she was and sees who she might will be and speaks that life and love and healing and wholeness into her. Just as Christ sanctifies the church. It's not just believing the best about her, but enabling her to get her, giving her the tools, helping her defeat those voices of self-doubt and condemnation and soar to heights previously unknown. A kingdom husband should seek to outserve his wife. Christian love should be a contest on who's going to outserve who. And in most cases, it's not about who does which household chore, but it's about working together to create a good and happy home. That's why I called that message today having a happy home. A happy home. Not only should you love one another, but you need to cherish each other, folks. Look at verses 28 through 32, y'all. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hated his own flesh, but cherishes it, nourishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it's about Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Men, cherish your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Cherish her, protect her, care for her lovingly, and hold her dear. Now listen, wives should cherish us too, y'all. But really, we need to value each other as human beings. <laughs> value each other as the most important human beings in our, each other's lives, for the most part. I mean, live your life so that that other person in your marriage is the best important person in your life. That's how to love them like Christ loved the church. Love your wife as your own body. Now, guys, I know this is hard for some of y'all to understand. Because I know when we look at the mirror, we see all the faults, right? No, that's how ladies see themselves. We look and go, yeah, I'm pretty good. I still got some strength. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, guys, I know this is hard for you, but I need you to listen. Most of us don't forget to eat, okay? Listen, most of us don't forget to drink. Most of us 
don't have a problem thriving and taking care of our own bodies. And we need to take that same understanding of when we're hungry or when we're thirsty or when we're tired and take that care and that compassion and apply that to our marriage. Make sure you understand her and listen to her. It's our job to feed our wives mentally and emotionally and psychologically. Her health is our safeguard. Her health. Care for it as you would your own well-being. Man, I served with this guy on my last duty station. And I won't tell you his name because maybe he might listen. I don't know. But one day he was walking home. And in Florida and Louisiana, we have these big, almost wadis, these big ditches on the side of the road. And he fell into the ditch and he must have broken every ligament in his knee when he fell. So he was taken and put on temporary duty until he got all the surgeries he needed for his leg. And they called him in with this brace on his leg to try to stand at attention in front of the commander. And he said, I did a good job. And he said, what? Yeah, I didn't drive home from the bar drunk. I walked home from the bar drunk. And the commander said, you know, if it had been raining that day where you were passed out in that ditch, you could have drowned to death. In fact, I know one person in Louisiana who did drown to death by passing out drunk in one of those holes on the side of the road. So this is a real thing. So he comes back and he's angry. This is a guy I worked with. He's angry. He's angry because he goes, man, I got drunk and I fell in a hole, but at least I didn't drive drunk. And he didn't understand it. He didn't take care of his body. He didn't put himself in the right position to be successful. And that's what marriage is all about, y'all. When men, when we are safeguarding our wives, we are to make sure that they don't fall down these ditches of life. We need to make sure they don't fall down that hole of self-destruction or self-doubt or self-hatred. We may not be able to always stop our loved ones from walking down a path that hurts themselves, but we can at least offer them a hand out rather than pushing them down into that depression because we're members of the same body for parts of the body to function well they function well together listen when I first started lifting weights I had a goal I was gonna bench press 225 and I focused on it for six months and you know what I did I did not make it <laughs> I did not make it and I was training really heavy and I was lifting 18 reps that goes one two three four uh, 18 15 and 12 and I was doing it six days a week and I just didn't understand I wasn't getting stronger and I was really upset until a guy who'd been wait, lifting weights a lot longer than me came to me he said Josh what are you doing I said man I'm trying to get stronger no matter how much I do this it doesn't work he said you're doing it wrong I said what do you mean I'm doing it wrong he said I want you to start doing five sets of five and see what happens and then I could lift 225 230 300 I got into the 400s with my bench press because now, instead of trying to do it my way and just guessing, I had the right tools on how to try to lift weight. And my body was now functioning together. I was training in the right way to get the results that I wanted. Listen, when I made that switch, it strengthened me. In the same ways in our marriage, we can't ignore one part of the body. We can't make our marriage all about ourselves any more than we can make our marriage all about the other person. There's got to be a holy balance, y'all. Or else you're going to end up like one of those dudes who's got a really strong left arm and a really weak right arm. We need to be balanced. Because when you're doing bench press, you're not going to be able to lift if they both can't lift that much. So the parts of the body have to work well together. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother holding fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. Listen, this is not just a biblical definition or description of sex in marriage. But it's a description of the spiritual, psychological connection that happens in marriage. That men should leave their family of origins behind and cling to their new families. The new family is his priority, not his parents anymore, but his new wife and his new children that they will have together. And in their time, that meant that they would build an addition onto their home. Listen, they didn't even move out from their parents back then. They just moved down the hall and they built an addition onto their homes. So they had to have that reminder that just because you live down the hall from mom and dad doesn't mean they're your priority anymore. You need to prioritize each other. Listen, I know one family years ago where the wife would go visit her family about three hours, two hours away every weekend, about 80, 90% of the time. 
Okay? That's not showing that your family's a priority. I, I don't care if you take the kids with you. I don't care if the dad likes it because he gets to spend every weekend by himself. That's not showing your kids and your family that you're a priority. Yet time and time again, we do this. We schedule events on the weekend. We try to make it so that we're separate from each other on the weekend. And listen, there's a time and a place to become an empty nester. And I'm looking forward to it already. But you're going to live with that person that you're married to for the rest of your life, y'all. Don't think you can ignore them for 20-something years and then come back together and it'd be okay. Y'all are going to be looking at each other like you're weird because those kids aren't in between you anymore. Spend some time together. Get to know each other. Continue to date each other. Continue to know each other. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you're living it out right now. Then Paul says this. This is a mystery, a profound mystery. But what I'm saying is about Christ and the church too. See, Christ has joined himself to the church. It's no longer about the old set of Jewish laws and regulations and sacrifice system in the past. It's about something new and something different and something better. So marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. It's hard to understand. It doesn't always make sense. You know, there's one mystery of statistics that I'd like to clear up this morning. Y'all ever heard that statistic that half of all marriages end in divorce? Have y'all heard that? Well, I'm here to tell you it's a specious lie. <laughs> you see, a pollster looked into this idea that half of marriages end in divorce, and he saw that it was a mistake that somebody working for the U.S. Census made. This person had recorded that there had been 2.4 million new marriages and that there had been about 1.2 million divorces. Y'all, there's a lot more marriages than that in America. They didn't count all the marriages that have been going 20, 30, 40, 50, even three years strong. So the idea that half of all marriages end in divorce is actually a statistical anomaly, or you could say a lie. We'll, we'll just be nice this morning and say they made a rounding mistake. Y'all know what the actual figure is? It's around 2%. Around 2% of marriages, based on this data that they were looking at, ends in divorce. If your marriage is having problems, it does not mean that it'll end in divorce definitely. It makes you normal. If your marriage has problems, it makes you normal. If your marriage has never had problems the whole time you're married, then you are in rarefied air, and I'm not sure that I believe you. Anytime two people are coming together, you're going to have differences of opinions, y'all. Let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. See, the love here in verse 25 is in the form of a command. God is telling the husbands, love your wives. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. You got to do it, guys. And it's agape. It's unconditional. So even marriage, the one we thought was unconditional, is actually is very unconditional. It's not conditional. Conditions don't apply here, y'all. Both of us need love. And both of us need respect. But wives are told that their men need respect here. See, there's something unique about the male personality and the male ego that we need to be supported and really cared for. You know, if I know my wife loves me, I'm having a good day. But when I know that my wife respects me and supports me, uh, man, there's something about it that makes me feel like I can accomplish great things. Like when she tells me, I think you can accomplish great things. I believe her. If some of y'all said that, I wouldn't. <laughs> but that's my wife, and she knows how messed up I am. And she's saying that to me, I'm going to believe her. See, there's something about that respect that feeds into us, and, 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 I, and I love it when it happens. See, love and acceptance are both important for both parties, but there's something unique about romantic love in women that the Bible is talking about here, that we need to embrace our wives and give them the acceptance and the, and the physical and emotional security that they need. You know, Harlequin Publishing House publishes romance novels for a business. And they've been in business for over half a century. And every year, there's 180 million romance books sold. That's 5.5 books a second. We just sold 30 books, y'all. Psychology Today in a 1992 study of 657 married couples in America found that American marriages were much healthier than you might have imagined. And the two greatest indications of whether or not you were going to have a good marriage was number one, do you pray together? Do you ever pray together as a married couple? 
And number two, did you cohabitate before marriage? The two greatest indications of whether or not your marriage is successful are two things that the Bible recommends, are two things that Christian ethics teaches. You think that's a surprise to God? No, he set it up that reason. He set up that way for a reason. I love this quote. A happy marriage is a long conversation that always seems short. Ralph and Janice had been married for 50 years. And the pastor called him forward and said, Hey, you want to come talk about your marriage? He said, Sure. He comes to the front. The pastor says, Can you tell us the keys to your success in marriage? He said, Yes. You have to love your wife. You have to care for your wife. You have to be there for your wife. And most importantly, you need to celebrate life with your wife. And he says, for our 15th wedding anniversary, we went to Beijing, China. Best trip of my life. We had a great time. For our 25th anniversary, we went to Berlin. Second best trip of my life. The pastor said, where are y'all going to go? For your 50th anniversary. He said, I guess i got to go back to Germany and pick her up. <laughs> you see, one of the keys to a healthy, good marriage, y'all, is maintaining your sense of humor. All right? Don't get overly serious about this and feel a burden in a negative way. But you got to ask yourself this question. Is my marriage going the distance? Is my marriage going the distance? Submit. It is mutual in marriage to submit. Remember, submission is a choice. Men don't dominate your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. But don't feel like you have to change your personality. Be balanced in our approach. Make decisions together. Pray about that submission to Christ. And men, make decisions that are not the best for you, but the best for y'all. Love one another. Love is hard. Love is imperfect, but we try to do our best. Men crave respect and women crave acceptance and love. Listen, we both need both. But make sure, wives, to respect your husbands today. Do something that shows you respect them. Husbands, make sure you go and show some love to your wife. Write her a little note. Get her some flowers. Do something. Y'all, this is an easy sermon application. Cherish each other. Live your life like your other partner really matters. Value them. Care for them. Listen to their opinion. Make decisions based on how much you care for each other. Not how you feel that day. Not what they've done for you lately. That scorekeeping nonsense doesn't work. Listen, you have an opportunity to respond this morning. I'm going to say something that's probably different than what you're used to. I think our whole church should come up here today. We need to pray for marriages in America, y'all. Marriages are under attack in our country right now. Listen, maybe your marriage is okay, but are your children's marriages okay? Are your grandchildren's marriages okay? Are your cousin's marriages okay? Come down and pray for whoever's marriage God puts on your heart. But I do want to tell you, I'm here to help you. And if you want to pray or you want to talk through it, I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing new under the sun. In a couple of years, I heard everything you could hear in marriage. I'm just being honest with you, there's nothing new. There's nothing new. It's just repackaging of the same problems. And we think we're unique and we're different, but we're not. Each and every one of us struggle for intimacy and balance in our marriages. And I want to invite each and every person who feels led to come forward during our response time and pray for marriages. As our musicians come forward, I want to give you all an opportunity to respond. Maybe your marriage isn't doing so great and you need to come down and pray with me I invite you to do that. Maybe you don't want everybody to see you do that. Maybe you've been in a Baptist church your whole life, but you don't feel like doing that today. <laughs> then you just come forward and just pray by yourself. Or husbands, bring your wife with you. Pray. Pray for your marriage. Pray that your marriage gets better. Pray that your marriage gets deeper. Pray that your marriage gets more spiritual. Pray for your cousins and your uncles and your children and your grandchildren. we got to pray for marriages, y'all. Marriages in our country are under attack. We can't even decide if it's between men and women anymore. Much less what it looks like. So I invite you to come forward and respond in prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the burden of this marriage today. The burden of, of, of our marriages, Lord. The, the burden of our marriages in our country, Lord. The burden of our marriages in our personal marriages, God. 
Father, we desire more intimacy. Father, we desire deeper connection. Father, we desire better leadership in the home. Father, we desire better action in the home. God, but, it, but we're so tired. We're so beat up. We're so exhausted. And we need you, Lord. God, we need you to make our marriages work. And we invite you this morning to come down into our midst. And meet us where we are and give us what we need. Thank you that there's forgiveness and grace and hope. No matter where we are in the spectrum. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Dear God, we come to you this morning. We thank you that we could have the opportunity to worship you and learn more about you and, and how we need to, to be in our marriages. I just pray that you be with each and every one of us and help us to really take to heart what Pastor Josh has said and, and what God has said um, about marriage. And please be with us as we go throughout this week. In your name I pray, amen.